Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is immense uh, pride and privilege to welcome Professor uh, De Costa here. I have known Professor De Costa's work for more than a decade in his warehousing and logistics field, especially in the area of uh, content terminals, uh, warehousing, and uh, optimization, and several other fields. So there were several accolades and awards that he received. Uh, several best paper awards in DOM, I and actions, and several other awards. He is very distinguished, very well known in this particular. When I welcome him to IMA, he was very really eager to accept this request and I am glad that he is here today. And uh, without much detail, I would request him to uh, deliver this seminar, which is on uh, logistics human factor and whether the manager is able to play. It's a So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, I'm happy to uh, have accepted the invitation of uh, Professor Roy. Uh, uh, Professor Roy and I, we go together already quite some time, huh, since 2011, I think when he was uh, visiting uh, Rotterdam, so since then has been visiting Rotterdam quite a few times, and together we have been starting a research cooperation. And we started in, in container terminals first, so uh, projects on container terminal optimization, modeling, and then we gradually moved into warehousing, and now even to behavioral aspects. So my talk today is on behavior. So this is not my uh, interest since long, so I'm, I um, have done more work as an operations researcher, but this is an interest that I developed over time, and I'll explain to you why I think it's so important and what you can do with it. So, logistics, the human factor, can the manager make a difference, that's the talk, and you might wonder who are these two people on this photo. It's not very well visible, maybe, but these two people are, uh, well, apparently this guy holds a trophy in his hand, and that's right, because He's the logistics manager of the year in the Netherlands. And he's handed over the trophy by this lady over there, and she was the logistics manager of the year the year before. So she hands over the trophy to this guy. And these two people are lo the logistics manager of the year. And you get that award because you do something special. So it's not an award for your company, it's an award for your person. So what have these people done? What these people have to do in order to get the award is you have to run a very innovative project, something really groundbreaking, at least for your company, groundbreaking. And second, you have to be a leader because doing a project is not something that you can do by yourself. First, you have to get your superiors with you. If your managers don't support you, you can forget you get it done. You also get, have to get the support of your colleagues and you have to get the support of the people who you supervise. So as a logistics manager, you usually have many people below you, but without those, you cannot get it done. So the management qualities, qualities we explicitly try to judge. I say we because I'm also chairing this award, so I know these people quite well. So I think these people have really done something special in their companies. Um, OK, so my program for today, I have a basically four topics in the coming hour. First one is, can we reduce accidents? Well, accidents reduction, I, think, I can tell you, is something extremely hot in Europe, in the US, and I would say it should be hot in India as well, because there are so many accidents here. There is something to improve here. Can we reduce the number of accidents? And all my topics here are related to warehousing. So I took one subject, which is warehousing. I know quite a bit about warehousing. So it's all about warehouse, accident within warehouse, published in JOM in 2011. Second one is, okay, who should we hire in order to run our operations in order to improve performance, productivity, accidents, job satisfaction of the workers? Which type of leader should we have? That's published in POM together with Daan Stam and Jelle de Vries, 2016. Next one is, can we increase the productivity of workers on the shop floor and how should we do that? And is it lasting? It was also published in POM in 2016 with the same uh, co-authors. And the last one, if I have some time left, I'll just touch on this one. This is a bit of different nature type of paper. So these are more uh, empirical, this is more OR. Uh, but only if I have time left, I'll touch on that one. So can we reduce the time needed for picking. You might say this is in line with that, but this is a completely different approach. 
And by the way, this is paper is not published. I'm having difficulty in getting it published. So, who knows? Anyway, what we want to do as a manager, you want to reduce accidents at the shop floor. This should be one of your prime goals. Get fewer accidents. We also want to have better productivity and we want to reduce breaking time. So this is what we want to achieve. So let me start with the first paper and I have to apologize to uh, some people who attended the conference as I am because I gave the same talk there. Who attended that conference? One, two, three. So apologies to you because this is a repetition for you. <laughs> uh, so, but it's exactly the same. But anyway, so these are two pictures I took from the internet when I browsed on the following terms, accidents, warehouse, and forklift. And if you browse on these three terms, you get an enormous amount of hits. It's incredible so many hits you get with photos, with movies, showing all kinds of accidents and forklifts. And so this picture shows you a warehouse. And you might wonder, what happened in that warehouse? Well, I have not been there when they took the picture, but I can guess. So, there are three people who know the answer, I guess, now. But for the others, what do you think might have caused this accident? It's pretty bad, eh? Any idea what a potential cause is? Well, let me give you a hint. I browse for three things. Accidents, warehouse, and forklift. Yes, Professor Data. You mean this one? I'm referring to this one first. Oh, yeah, do, please do the left one first. Yes, the forklift ran into the rack. It hit an upright. But usually you know what happens in a warehouse. When a forklift hits an upright, it's not like he, boom, drives like that against an upright. No, he makes a turn and he just hit it with a tail, you know, just a bit. And what do you get? You get just a small dent in the rack. What happens? Nothing happens. The racks are pretty firm, you know. They don't collapse. They don't. They're just a small dent. So what does the forklift driver do when he hits a rack like that? He looks left. He looks right. No one saw me. And he continues, you know. That's what happens. But you know what happens when the next forklift hits the same upright? The next forklift, because now the rack supports many pallets, you know, and they're all very heavy, up to 1,500 kilograms per pallet. So you have eight pallets on top of each other that are supported by a couple of uprights. One of them is weakened. It is like this. Now the next forklift hits it with a tail, and then what happens? The rack bends over, and all these racks are parallel. So if one rack collapses, it may hit the next one, and you get a domino effect. And I think that's what happened over there. I'm not sure, of course. I wasn't there when it was taken. But this is what might happen. Now this one. Professor Dutta, you seem to know the answer, right? You don't. <laughs> it fell down. But why does a forklift fall over? How can that happen? I can tell you forklifts might fall over if they have a heavy load and they lift and they take a curve, for example. They're slightly out of gauge and he might just tumble over. But that's not what happens here because this is outside. I don't see a load. And forklifts usually don't lift high and make a curve outside. You know, why would they do that? There's no reason. There's no rack to store something. So it must be something different why it fell over. What is the something different? I'll give you a hint. You see this hole here? There's a hole in the wall. What do you think this hole is? Yeah, the forklift came out. This is a dock gate. This is a dock. A dock are used for docking a trailer, a truck. So the truck docks with a tail against the dock gate. And then forklifts start loading and unloading the truck. Now you can also do it by hand, but if it's on pallets, you use a truck for that. And then there might have been some miscommunication between the forklift driver and the driver of the truck. The driver of the truck thinking, I'm done, I can leave. The forklift driver, hey, I still have to get this pallet in or out. Miscommunication. So the truck slivers away, the forklift gets out, and it just tumbles over. 
I'm not sure, but this is what might have happened. Okay, there are a lot of accidents in the Netherlands. Uh, so if you look at the Netherlands, there are about 219,000 serious work-related accidents per year, approximately. Um, between uh, approximately 100 occupational deaths per year, so deaths related to work, um, and a lot of costs. Now you might say 100 deaths per year. Uh, that's nothing. It's, it's not that much, maybe. But we consider it to be a lot. We think it should be less. And for us, this is prime priority. And I can tell you that's the same in many countries in Europe as well as in the US. Companies consider this prime priority. Reducing the number of accidents at work. Now, if you look at warehouses, so let's limit it a bit to warehouses. There are 1,700 serious accidents per year, of which 150 lead to permanently disablement. Uh, and seven lethal, approximately, per year. Seven lethal in a warehouse per year. And we consider that to be a lot. And we put a lot of effort into it in order to reduce these accidents. Now, let's look at the US. Yes, of course. No, no, I don't have these statistics exactly, but I can still estimate it pro capita, for example, or per, per warehouse worker approximately. And then it's not that many, I can tell you. Yes, there are some costs involved, and that includes some of the time. This is only direct cost, to be honest. This is only direct cost, it excludes the time lost. That should be added on top of this. Um, but in the US, the number of accidents is a lot larger. It's 95,000 approximately. Uh, that's forklift related, so you have to compare this to that. Now you might look at the populations, US 300, then have 17 million, even if you prorate it like that, it's a lot more, I can tell you. US is doing so much worse than the Netherlands. Netherlands, in fact, doing pretty well. We're in the top in the world as far as accidents are concerned. Fewest accidents per worker. But still, now let's look at India. There are no good statistics there. So the statistics are only estimates. It's between 5 and 7.5 million per year. That's a different number. So that's huge. It's really huge. 20 to 30 accidents happen in the steel plants. As Sorry? Well. 20 to 30 fatalities happen in the steel plants itself. Only the integrated steel plants. Yeah. That statistics I have got. Oh, terrible. So look here. Between this are estimates only. Eh? For Hindi, India, 50 to 75,000 people die on the workplace per year. Uh, estimates. Okay. So we can improve something, right? And there should be. We should improve something. Um, and that basically triggered my research. And so I wanted to see whether we can do something as academics. In, or, in order to do that, I wanted to uh, answer this question. This is my research question. How can we reduce the accident? What helps in order to get them down? What should we do? And this is a picture that was mailed to me by one of my students. And it shows a person climbing a rack in order to get something. And well, this is just one of my students who mailed that, one of my MBA students. And you might wonder, why is this guy climbing a rack? Well, of course, I don't know. But in warehouses, believe me, this, this person knows he should not climb a rack. He knows it. It's not like he doesn't know. He knows it. He's been trained. He's been instructed. Don't climb a rack. But you know, he's climbing a rack. How should he get something from there? How should he do that normally? No, in a warehouse you don't use stairs. You use a forklift for that, right? So the forklift driver retrieves the pallet, puts it on the ground, you take the one item and the forklift driver has to put it back. But you know there's a customer waiting for this guy, there's pressure, I have to get this item fast. The forklift is nowhere in sight. I don't know where it is. So, what should I do? Wait until I finally find it or just get it now myself for this customer who's really needing it fast. You know, so there's a dilemma and this guy makes a choice. And it's not a choice that's good for safety, it might be good for the customer though. Huh? So, my question was, what can we do in order to bring accidents down? That's my research question. Now, I'm also chairing another award that's called the Safest Warehouse of the Year award. 
So I have to audit a lot of warehouses. I go to all these places. We have elaborate tours. There are also, also auditors, professional auditors go there. So I see so many good companies who are really exceptionally good. And they take so many different measures. You don't believe it. For example, one of the things you might notice is trucks cannot slither away from a dog door because there is a wheel cag. And in this case, the wheel cag is connected to a power outlet and inside there is a green light. So the forklift driver now knows it's safe to enter this trailer. You can do it. There is no danger whatsoever. And when it's un uncoupled, it becomes red. So you can no longer go in it safely. This is another company that came up with the idea of a safety fence on a forklift. So again, the risk of a forklift is if you have a heavy load, you lift and you make a turn while doing that, you might fall over. So in order to prevent that the driver falls underneath the truck and is crushed by the truck, you have to wear a safety belt. It's compulsory. It's probably compulsory to wear a safety belt in India for a taxi driver, you know? But there are very few who do it. And the same is true for forklift drivers. There are so few who really wear the safety belts. Why don't they wear it? Well, they know it's safer, but you know they have to get in and out all the time, and they just find it inconvenient to do it. So this company came with the ID, the company is Nissan. They came up with the ID, let's have a safety gate. We first close the gate, and it only drives when the gate is closed. Now, you cannot fall outside the truck, so you don't need a safety belt anymore. Problem solved. Um, this is a so-called narrow aisle. In a narrow aisle, so it's only 1.6 meters wide, in an narrow aisle you have dedicated trucks that drive in this narrow aisle. Very big, heavy, huge machines weighing up to 70 tons. They're really very heavy. Sorry, 7 tons, not 70, 7 tons, sorry. But still, if it hits you, don't believe, you will have nothing left. Eh? You, you experience something. You probably get crushed or whatever. So in order to prevent that this person on foot is hit by a truck, he just puts a safety cone as a procedure. Put a safety cone in front of the aisle so that the truck driver is now warned, don't enter this aisle when there is someone on foot. Or you can close it off temporarily with a safety line like this. So every aisle here in this warehouse has just a safety line which you can attach. Very simple device and effective. This is a video of a safety uh, light. It's called a blue spot. Well, the sound is not important. It's a blue spot mounted on a truck. So it's an extremely simple device. You can see it clearly. Even in broad daylight, you see the blue spot in front of you, so you stop as a pedestrian. So you're not hit by a forklift. I would say nearly well, nearly 100% of the warehouse that uses trucks in the Netherlands now has a blue spot. It's a very cheap device. It's just a light. It automatically goes on if you drive backward. Very simple, not expensive, and effective. This is a safety mirror. Here you have a safety line, so they can don't, cannot fall down. This worker works very high, high elevation. This is a company where they have safety rules and guidelines. And what they do is they have attached all these safety rules and guidelines next to the entrance. Everyone can see it, right? So everyone can, everyone can read it. Everyone can, can read it. No, but you have to read it like that in order to read it. So I'm not sure how effective this one is. And this company uses 5S. 5S stands for doing things right the first time. Keep your house clean. Put everything in the right place. That's 5S and control procedures to maintain that. So you can see it looks very clean, very organized. In this company, you have to hold the railing when you walk on a stair and you cannot run. So maybe it helps to have accidents reduced. In this company, you cannot just leave your warehouse truck, or this is a cleaning truck, by the way, it's not a warehouse truck, it's a cleaning truck, but these are warehouse trucks. Uh, you cannot just leave it on the spot when you have to do something else temporarily. You have to bring it to a designated parking spot. This is the parking spot for you, for your truck. So, always on the right place. 
Uh, and this company, the truck managers, the truck drivers have to give their key to the inbound manager who attaches it to the door, the dog door. Now the dog door goes open and there's no way you can depart without the dog door being closed again. So there's a lot of measures you can take. This is some measures with respect to forklifts. So I was wondering when I started this research, what measure really helps? And I showed you just a couple of pictures. I can tell you there are hundreds of potential measures you can take. There are so many, but which one is the most effective? That was my question. Now, you might have some idea yourself uh, what the most effective measure is. So let me just see whether you have a good idea. I have here 12 measures. I hope you can read it. These are the measures. And you have to cast one vote. One vote. And don't refrain from voting. Cast one vote. And there are some people who know, uh, well, just think what you think is the most obvious measure that helps most. The first measure is make everything tidy. Clean it. Hygiene. Clean, organized workplace. The second one is train your employees for safety. Give them safety training. The third one is safe storage and parking. Put everything where it belongs. Don't drop things temporarily on all kinds of spots. Put it where it belongs. Equipment and products and product carriers like pallets. Put them at the right place. Next one, separate your people on foot from your trucks. Do it in space. Here are the trucks, here are the people on foot, not at the same place, or separate them in time, not at the same time at the same place. Next one, safety signaling, like unidirectional traffic, like don't go here, go there. Uh, yield rules for traffic rules. Uh, safety meters, things like that. Safe dog door measures. Safe and certified equipment. Inspect your racks regularly for dents. Inspect your trucks. So make sure they are safe to use. Implement 5S. Implement Six Sigma. Leadership. The safety consciousness of your people. Or all of the above is equally important. Okay, let's cast votes. Who thinks cleanliness and hygiene is the most important, effective thing you can do? Well, that's zero. Then safety training. Train your people for safety, that's two. Then safe storage and parking, that's zero. Then separation of people on foot and trucks in time and space. Is, is that a vote or not? Yeah. Okay. Then safety signaling. Zero. Safe dog door measures. Zero. Then 5S. Uh, sorry, safe and certified equipment. <coughs> That's zero. 5S. Zero. Six Sigma. Is that a vote? Six Sigma? Yeah. Leadership. Two. Three, four. Safety consciousness of the workers. So one vote. Two votes, sorry. Uh, I'm thinking you voted twice, Professor Data. Uh, you're cheating. Uh. <laughs> this one? Yeah, okay. Okay, I think we have one vote too many now. All of them is, are equally important. That's two votes. Including some double counting? I don't. Okay. Um, so, the top three, or the top four here. This is number one. You cannot read it. Uh, what is this one? So, that's leadership, and X equal we have safety training, safety consciousness, and everything is important. So I think you have a pretty good uh, intuition what is important and what is not. We wanted to find out what is really the Im most important one. And in fact, we all included, not this one, all of the things, well, we included all of the things to start with, of course. But in our hypothesis, we thought there are some particular ones that are more important. But we definitely included leadership, safety consciousness, and also safety training in our first model. So 
there are two theories that tell something about what really helps and or that help you in determining what determines accidents or what might prevent accidents. And the first one says, well, basically it's unavoidable that you have accidents. If you have a complex system, accidents will happen. And the second theory says, well, there exist highly reliable organizations, even in complex systems that are tightly coupled. And this is due to specific management practices. So basically these two theories are sort of opposite and they are not in line with each other. And the question which of the two is more valid in practice? So I thought the second one was more valid uh, because I see so many good warehouses. I think you can do something about it. Come on, this must help. All these measures that you're taking, they help. Um, so then we came up with a model. The dependent variable here is the number of accidents per employee over a certain time period, per direct employee, employee on the shop floor, right? So accidents per employee over a certain time period. That's our dependent. Now we thought, in line with what you have been thinking, and also in line with literature, that one of the most important drivers for accidents was the safety consciousness of the workers. If they are more conscious about safety, well, they will not take so many risks. So it will impact their behavior. And their behavior determines accidents. So then we included leadership. And this is a specific form of leadership. It's called transformational leadership. Now, transformational leadership is a leadership style which differs from the opposite, which is transactional leadership. Now, transactional leadership is a leadership style where you have a boss, superior, and you have an employee. And that relation is based on a transaction. Like, I'm the boss, I tell the employee, you have to do that. I expect you to do these things. Employee expects payment from the boss in order to do these jobs. That's a transactional relation. But transformational leadership is something different. It's like, I want to achieve something, and I want to basically infer that on my employees. I want to transfer my beliefs, my goals, my objectives, my well, my important things in life on my employees, transformational. And in this case, with respect to safety. So it's safety specific transformational leadership. That was the construct we were looking for. We thought it will influence the safety consciousness of the employees, so it's a mediator, but it also have a direct impact. And then we looked for all these different measures, hazard reducing systems. So this is one variable, but it's not. These are hundreds of potential measures that you can take. But to make the model a bit more, well, easy to understand, I just put it in one box. But in fact, there, might be, there are hundreds of these measures that you might take. And we also looked at the, the quality of the registration system. How well do you register accidents, near accidents? OK, so this is the model we want to investigate. And there are some hypotheses involved, but it's not as a simple model as you might assume. There are a number of difficulties if you want to study a model like this. Uh, let's start with the unit of analysis of this model. So what is the prime unit of analysis? What is the data point here? All dependent is accidents, right? Accidents per employee per year. So what is the unit of analysis where you measure that? Number of what? Number of fatalities. Yeah, that's your dependent variable. The, no, not fatalities. Accidents. That's something different, right? Fatalities are part of that, but it's not exclusive. So number of fatalities. No, no, I'm saying the same. Number of accidents number of per employee per year. Right? Well, per, per year, per time period, right? That's my dependent. So what is the unit for which I'm measuring this? Yeah, that's my dependent. But what is the unit of analysis of, wo of what am I measuring this? Warehouse. Yeah, of a warehouse. So my unit of analysis is a warehouse. The thing between walls. No, no, just the building. Inside, the process inside. The process inside. That's my unit of analysis. So a company may have 100 warehouses. 
but that means it might have 100 data points for me if I can measure all these different warehouses, right? But if you look at a dependent, that's not an easy variable. That's not an easy property of this process. Why is it not easy to determine that? Remember, how many accents are there in the Netherlands? Well, we have 10 fatalities. Over, sorry, 100 fatalities in the whole country and all the workplaces, but in warehouses, only seven. So there's only seven fatalities per year. Only seven. And there are very few accidents. 1,700. You remember that number? 1,700. So how many accidents are we going to track here? That's not a lot, eh? We are going to track. So it's very rare data. That we're going in India, I would have a lot of data, I guess. But in the Netherlands, I have rare data. It's really rare data. It's not like there's an abundance of data. That means you have to have a lot of, well, companies, a lot of uh, time also. But the time is also different, difficult, because it's accidents per employee, huh, because I have to, of course, prorate it per employee. But also the time period is difficult. If I take a very long time horizon, I have more accidents, of course. But the chance that it's due to this transformational leadership of that manager decreases because... Ten years ago, there was a different manager, and he was replaced uh, seven years ago and four years ago. I cannot take a too long horizon also. That makes it difficult. And there's another difficulty. How can I measure safety consciousness, do you think, of the workers? How do I do that? Questionnaire. A questionnaire. So meaning, one data point is a warehouse. But in order to get this variable right, I have to interview I have to survey the people on the shop floor. So for one data point, I have to survey all these people on the shop floor, and I get only one data point for that. So this is measured at warehouse level. This is measured at worker level. How do I measure whether a manager is a good transformational leader? I can ask the manager. But I can tell you, everyone thinks he or she is a great transformational leader. I'm a great transformation. Everyone thinks that, you know. Everyone overrates himself. For sure. So you have to ask the people on the shop floor. Anonymous. Blind. So that's also difficult to establish. And this is measured on the warehouse level. So we have different levels at which we measure these things. And also accidents, we have to check that also. We have to double check. So we check with the Ministry of Social Affairs. Because all the heaviest types of accidents have to be reported. Now, there's another problem here. It's rare data, and there are so many different types of accidents. Lethal to a scratch on my finger. That's also an accident. To near accidents. I cannot just add them up, you know. How many scratches is equal to one lethal accident? I wouldn't know. So I have to measure lethal. Well, me basically, you measure them in four different categories. So there are four variables here, not one. So it's not such an easy research. It's pretty tough, in fact. So it took us years to do it. So we have been working on this for three or four years. So in total, we have 78 data points. We surveyed uh, 1,000 uh, workers. Um, this is how we selected them, etc. So I'll sk just skip that. This is how we measure the dependent, four different categories of accidents. How do you arrive at all these hazard-reducing systems? Um, well, we were lucky because there was just a handbook was published with, in total, 300 potential measures you might take. So then we had a problem. If we ask a manager 300 questions plus all the other questions we wanted to ask, the survey would last an hour. How many managers are willing to spend one hour for us plus have us surveyed older workers? How many managers are willing to do that? You understand the difficulty of getting this done? It was really tough. So, but basically, we boiled it down to 69 different measures. And there are four categories according to this handbook. So there are many different types of things you might do. Like in procedures, these are all procedure type of things. These are more uh, physical things. Uh, this is more training, competencies. These are other more general things, like nice ergonomics, light, nice lighting, uh, bright atmosphere, you know, all these things you might do. It's a lot of different types of things. How do you what? These all came from the hand. These were written down in this book. So we went through this book. It was a very thick book. 
very unstructured, but we were so lucky it was there. And this is just from that book. And this is the grouping that was given in that book. And all these things were, of course, described how you might do it. Eh? So, but what he did is he did a factor analysis because all these measures, well, we, we boiled them down to 69, and 69 is still too big to include in, in a model with consists of 78 data points. Eh? Come on. But the, the model is completely, eh, it's completely, uh, will be completely wrong. Too many variables for the data points. So, you have to boil them down. So, he brought them down to four different factors using factor analysis, explaining, I think, 30% or so of the variance. So, it was not bad. It was pretty good, these four factors. They explain a lot. We boil them down to safe traffic, safety trading, hygiene, and safe storage. These were the four main factors. So, safe storage? Yes. One of you said that, right? Yes, we indeed got that. That was one of the main factors. Now, this is how you measure leadership. Transformational leadership, but then specifically with respect to safety. And it's all pretty obvious if you read it. So, transformational leadership, leader is someone who sets the example. If you don't set the example yourself with respect to safety, your workers will not follow you. They will not do it. You have to be better than the rest. If you tell your workers do this and you don't do it yourself, forget it. Next one, you have to inspire and motivate your workers. You have to stimulate your workers to think beyond what they're currently doing. Stimulate them to come up with ideas. You have to listen to your workers. It's not only broadcasting, it's also receiving and doing something with it. That's particularly the last one. You have to reward them. Not punish them, reward them when they do something well, in words, not necessarily in money. Reward them. It's very, very important. So these are pretty obvious uh, items for this construct. Safety consciousness is completely well established, so we just took that from, from literature. Okay, I'll just skip all that, it's all standard. Then you test the hypothesis, and this is what came out. Came out. Accidents are determined by well, not by safety consciousness. You might look at this. There's no relation whatsoever. So we were completely surprised. How is it possible that safety consciousness, in the literature is forecasted, that safety consciousness drives accidents? But then you look at literature, I would say, all the literature is flawed in this respect because it's all self-reported. There's so much self-response bias. So it's completely flawed. And we have objective different sources. We have three sources for this. So we just believe the literature is not right. Also, because there are other factors that are more important than safety consciousness. So we have the control for various other factors, like in our case for leadership. We see that leadership plays a dominant role. It also is a strong driver of safety consciousness. Also, storage matters a bit. Safe storage, not that much, not that strong, but it does strongly through transformational leadership. So, you might say transformational leadership is really the most important variable. Okay, you paid very good attention uh, <laughs> last presentation. So, it's very important. Now, the qu second question we had is what is the impact? What is the effect? So, we compared the top 20% managers with the bottom 20% with respect to Safety, tra specific, transformational leadership. The best ones with the poorest ones. And what we got is, the poorest ones have 115% more minor accidents. Plus, 88% more medium accidents. Plus, 135% more serious accidents. So, yes, it does have an effect. I don't put them down lethal because we didn't have a single lethal accident in our sample. Zero. So, yes, it does matter. And if you compare these warehouses using a spider diagram, so this is our benchmark, the red line. These are the five dimensions of safety-specific transformational leadership. More is better, so more outward is better. You score higher on this dimension of safety-specific transformational leadership. You see that one of our winners, which was SIVA, a couple of years ago, Siva Warehouse won this award for safest warehouse. They're basically better on all fronts. This manager is. Why is this warehouse good? Well, look at the manager. 
No? So there's a relation. Um, so that is the first paper. Now the second paper. So I'm going to do the next papers a bit faster. Second paper is basically a continuation of the first one. It's published in Palm uh, this year. Uh, and the question we had is, assume that you can now hire a manager for your facility. So you're in charge, and now you can hire the manager. And your objective is you want to bring down the number of accidents. Who should you hire? Can you test for that? And by the way, we also want to improve productivity, or at least we don't want that improving safety goes at the cost of reducing productivity. So we also wanted to control for productivity, see whether that had an effect. So who should we hire? And we looked particularly at a construct called regulatory focus. A regulatory focus, it determines how a person tries to achieve his or her goals. And there are two basic forms. The first one is, uh, so it's a construct well known from psychology or organizational behavior. The first one is called promotion focus. And the second one is called prevention focus. Now, promotion focus person sets the goals and goes for it. Yes, that's what I want to achieve. Nothing can stop me of getting there. But prevention focus person sets the goal and sees all kinds of obstacles on the way of getting there. So he or she tries to avoid these obstacles and still gets there by avoiding obstacles. So it's a different attitude, you might say. And you still might get there both, huh? You might get there both. And usually people are a bit more of one or the other. Now, okay, I have a small survey, but let's not make it too difficult. So whether you should hire one of these persons, what, which one has the most effect on these accidents? That was our question. Eh? Should the person be promotion focused? Should it be prevention focused? Should the person be both? Or, well, it doesn't make any difference. Well, we thought prevention focus makes a difference. So we also tested for promotion focus. In fact, we included both variables. But if you look at the effect, then what you find is that particularly prevention focused does the job. Promotion focus doesn't have any effect whatsoever. If you want to reduce, actually the, these numbers are, by the way, not correct. These are from the previous model, but now we include a different, uh, different additional variable. But I can tell you the strong effect exists of prevention focus. It has basically an impact on the type of leader, the type of leadership you exert, you, you are on the shop floor. Uh, and it has a strong effect on safety performance. And by the way, we also checked for these. Productivity, quality, and job satisfaction of the workers. And if you look at productivity and quality, if you go for more safety, it does not hinder productivity. Productivity is not affected whatsoever. By the way, also, quality does not seem to be impacted. But the job satisfaction of your workers does appear to be impacted a lot. So you have happier workers. Wow, that's great as well, right? Happier workers on the shop floor, fewer accidents, and you can test for this construct by seven questions. So it's not a very difficult thing to test. It's pretty easy. Um, okay, so that was our second paper in a nutshell. So conclusion of these first uh, two papers, uh, we think leadership is crucial for reducing accidents. So there are many things that are important, but we think it starts with the right leader, the right leader in the workplace. And all these other measures might help additionally, but it started with the right person, going for it. Um, in particular, prevention focus managers appear to perform better. And the focus on safety does not impact productivity or quality, but it does impact job satisfaction. Okay, this was our first work. And after that, we got enthusiastic for this topic. Behavior of leaders is important, but what about the behavior of the workers? Is that important as well? So in our next paper, we wanted to focus on the behavior of the people on the shop floor. Can we influence the behavior? Or how does the personality of a worker influence the output? Now, that was an interesting question as well. So that was our next project. And we uh, started the project on what determines the productivity of a worker? 
what can we do in order to increase it and to what extent does it depend on the personality of that worker so the title of this paper well, I think it's not a title but anyway what we're looking at is aligning the picking method so you have different ways to pick an order different methods with the personality of the picker and the incentives you give to that picker so we try to align these three things the right method for the right person with the right incentives does it matter that's basically the question okay so this is an order picker by the way so he walks uh, with a picking cart along a shelf rack and he picks items from the shelf rack for a customer order in this case using a paper list that tells him what he has to do for that customer order um, so we looked at different uh, objectives not only uh, throughput but also the quality of the work job satisfaction of different order picking methods with different incentive systems with different personalities of the people okay so what are the methods let's start with that well to pick orders we compared three different methods there are very straightforward methods there are many companies that use them method number one give a worker a pick list and let them work parallel everyone works on an order separate a straightforward way of doing it eh? parallel picking straightforward many companies just do it like this method number two slightly smarter maybe because in parallel picking what you end up with if you have a big warehouse is that people have to walk long distances so you have a lot of improductive walking time so method two copes with that it divides the warehouse in zones this is for picker one this is for picker two this is for picker three picker four and what we do is we pass the order from worker to worker so there's a buffer in between and we just pass it between the zones it's called sequential zone picking method number two now method number three is a bit in between these two in the sense that people pass the orders but there are no fixed zone boundaries so you can work as hard as you like or as slow as you like because the boundaries will automatically adapt right? you, the point where you hand it over will adapt so the advantage of parallel picking is you can work as hard as you like you're not dependent of another but here you are dependent of another if you want to work and there's nothing in your buffer you don't have to do anything you just have to wait you know so your working speed is also determined by your neighbors but here this is a bit in between it's sequential zoning but still you can work as hard as you like so it's in between now there's also a lot of different tools that you can use a pick by light pick by paper okay I, I skip all that a bit because in the end in this paper we only looked at paper based picking we didn't look at all the other methods although we have papers on that as well but I'll only focus now on the paper parts so we tried all three methods using a paper or the picking sheet now what incentives do we have we have two different types of incentives an individual based incentive or a team based incentive individual is something like the more you do the more you get uh, extra reward we, we physically paid them and eh? we paid them extra for oh no we didn't pay them sorry we gave an, uh, an iPad to the top so many so we said if you uh, are among the best you get an iPad individually the team incentive was if your team is the best everyone in the team gets an iPad at the top so many yeah, so that was the award incentive team or individual based by the way we looked at a lot of other uh, outputs uh, but I'm not going to focus on that and of course we looked at the picker personality which is regulatory focus again so we looked at is the picker more promotion focused or is the picker more prevention focused the same for the managers you have a question oh thought now how do we do it um, well we basically had four different rounds each of 10 minutes picking with questionnaires in between so it was quite a bit of work um, the questionnaires were also needed because every f after every round of picking you have to put everything back and I can tell you putting everything back in a rack is as much work as picking it probably even more it's more work because you have to sort it now so it's even more work so the first this part is just test and this is really gathering data uh, so 
you need, of course, to have, make the people familiar with the working method, and we gave them 10 minutes to get familiar, and then we registered the, the statistics during the next round. So this is basically how it works. So we had support of a lot of companies, and we built a warehouse. So they built a warehouse for us, in fact. Uh, so this was the warehouse we got. So it's at a school, for, a school for vocational education. This is a school where the students learn to become warehouse workers. So it was a great school for us. We could use their students to do this work. It was part of their training, you might say. So we were quite happy that they wanted to work with us, and they gave us this room. Well, they first gave us another room, and in the middle of the experiment, we had to break it down and to move to another building, but okay. Uh, anyway, this was the room we got, finally, and then with the help of all these companies, they built a warehouse for us. I can tell you this was a major job. We had two warehouse management systems. We had four different picking methods. Um, we had to buy the products, the pick carts. Oh, they all gave them to us, but still we had to specify them. It was a lot of work. So realizing this warehouse uh, was a couple of months' work. And also to make sure that all the RF systems and everything worked, it was and didn't hinder the experiment. But this was what it looked like. So this is a sketch of the warehouse we got. So there's basically two parallel aisles. So we did two groups in parallel. This was the space for group B, and this was the space for group A. So you work like this. This is the walking sequence. So everyone has 10 zones. Uh, so the aisles are identical, two, 10 sections, two levels. You can see on this picture, two levels, ground floor. You can see products here. And first floor, so you can easily get there. Um, with uh, five products per stock location. Uh, five locations per level. So every level had five locations. Um, in total, 1,000 dummy products. And the orders are a size of average 12 products. With uh, 12 different products, or so order lines. And a standard deviation of four order lines. So it's quite large orders. 12 order lines in a certain quantity. Okay, so this is our, some pictures of the experiment uh, going on. So we ran it during three months. We had uh, 363 participants. And anyway, a lot of pictures, quite hectic period to get it done. We also had three groups of participants. We had our students, Erasmus students. We had warehouse professionals. So we, uh, some companies uh, gave us warehouse workers. We said, well, you can use our warehouse work. We pay them, by the way. Huh? We also pay them. Uh, and we got them by bus. They came by bus. And then they picked wor orders for us. Where professional warehouse workers. And we had students of this vocational school for the warehouse workers of the future. So it was quite well spread. So we have quite a few Polish, as you can see. Particularly in the, in, in the professional, we had quite a few Polish. Uh, and we also have some other English-speaking people, particularly for the, from our students and also from warehouse workers. So this is how they were divided over men and women. <coughs> As you can see, in our school, men and women are reasonably balanced. Uh, for the professionals, that was not so much the case. And if you look at a, vo a vocational school, there are no women there for some reason. It's only guys. I don't know what it happens there. But okay. Okay, so... We focus on paper. These are the research questions. We look at the particular productivity, but also at quality and job satisfaction. We look at incentive system, so personal or team. And we look at the personality of the picker, promotion focus, prevention focus. Yeah? So what is the model? Um, this is the model. Our dependents are three performance measures, quality. Orders picked with, so the quality, the percentage of errors in this case. This is productivity. Productivity measured in good lines. Bad lines are not included. Good lines. Only good orders are counted. And job satisfaction of the individuals. Our main independent, the method. Parallel picking, sequential zone, bucket brigade zone. Right? Three methods. Condition. Individual incentive. Team incentive. And another condition, that's the regulatory focus of the worker. And you see this, in this case, there's even three-way interaction. So that's a pretty difficult thing to measure in general, huh, to get some, something relevant. 
How do you analyze this? Well, it's a multi-level model, multi-level regression, because we have variables measured at the individual level and at the team level. And so, for example, this is individual level, but this can also be team level, and this is also team output. Uh, for example, productivity can be team output. So we have individual and team, so two levels. And there are several control variables, of course, in this model also. Now let's look at hypothesis. Hypothesis. In parallel picking, individual incentives deliver the best performance. If you work for yourself, don't give a team incentive. Right? If you work in a zone, give a team incentive. Because in a zone, you're dependent on your neighbors. You can work very hard, but still you're going to work harder than your neighbors. Because if there is no work, you cannot work. Together, you determine the performance. And then there are some more complicated ones. Okay, let's... I don't want to discuss the more complicated ones. Let's just look at the results and then see what happens. First result. Team incentives or individual incentives. What should we have? These are the three different picking methods. Vertical axis is the output during 10 minutes. How many order lines did we pick in 10 minutes? Two lines. Individual incentives, that's the squares, and team incentives, that's the circles. The light gray. Now what you might notice, for parallel, give them an individual incentive and they get much more output. Indeed, straightforward. Our first hypothesis confirmed. This is a significant difference. It's really substantial. Look at the output, nearly 55 versus 47 or so. A substantial different average output per worker. Give them an individual incentive if you, if you work parallel. Look at this one, the zone picking. If you give them then an individual incentive, your productivity drops. But if you give them a team incentive, the productivity compared to this one goes even up. So now they just switch. Second hypothesis confirmed. Now look at this one. I mentioned this is a bit in between. And what you see is, yeah, the results are also not so different. They're pretty similar, right? And it's in between. So that might explain it. So indeed. In parallel picking, individual incentives lead to 21% more productive workers. They do more. Team incentives in a zone picking system lead to 25% increase in productivity compared to individual incentives. So yes, the differences are not small. They are big. And here they are not significant. Okay, that was the simple one. Now let's look at a bit more complicated hypothesis. More complicated. Meaning, we are now going to look also at promotion and prevention focus. What is the effect of that? Okay, first I look at the prevention focus people only. The people who try to avoid obstacles in order to achieve their goal, right? My goal, get an award. Huh? That's my incentive. Parallel, zone, dynamic, productivity. How much did I do? What you see is that the team incentive works best for in all situations. Even for parallel picking, you might remember individual incentives work best for parallel picking, eh? but not for prevention-focused people. For prevention-focused people, always team incentives work better. They work better in a team. Interesting, eh? I thought it was interesting. But how is it possible that, a, that an individual incentive leads to so much higher productivity here? How is that possible that we have this gap? Well, it's not because of these people. Because the prevention focus people just have it the other way around. How is it possible? It's because my promotion focus people, they start flying with an individual incentive. They start working so hard you can't believe it. So the gap is 21%, but the gap is negative for prevention and it's huge for promotion focus. So they do much more than 21%. They can go as high as 40% or 45% more productivity. It's incredible. And by the way, look also for the, uh, for the zone picking. For zone picking, team incentives always work best, even for the, you might say, the people that go for individual performance. Even for them, zone picking, still give them a team incentive. Don't give these people individual incentives. 
Okay, so I have a couple of other results, but in view of time, I think I should round up. I just want to give you one example. And the example is, I start with a warehouse. So what is the practical impact of this? Eh? Let's assume I have a warehouse with 20 pickers. And I know that 10 are more promotion focused, and the other 10 are more prevention focused. Eh? Just an average sample of people, some promotion, some prevention. And so what's my wage cost? Well, in the Netherlands, that would be uh, gigantic compared to India, I guess, $580,000. That's what I have to pay per year in wages for this warehouse. And I use zone picking, and I give them an in individual incentive, right? A small individual incentive. If they perform more than something, you get some incentive. Okay, this is the initial situation. Now what happens if I change my incentive system to a team incentive? Well, I get 34% more productivity, more output. I also get more errors, unfortunately. I get more errors simultaneously. Mm, that's not so nice, eh? But on the other hand, the errors were not that much. So 64% more of not so much is still not so much. But still, you get more errors. But then what I do is I send my people on a training. Because, you know, regulatory focus is not something that's part of your personality. It's something that can change. At least on the shorter term, you can change it by training. So I give all my workers training. And because of that, I'm able to change uh, five of the ten people that are currently uh, more uh, prevention focused, I am able to turn them into more promotion focused. So I have 15 promotion focused and five prevention focused. Okay. What happens then? I get even more productivity. So my productivity goes even up more and now my errors drop. Conclusion, well I can do it with fewer people. If I want to have the same output, I can save 160,000 dollars per year on salaries and in the end my errors don't go up a lot they change not so much so conclusion is you can save a lot in productivity you can gain a lot and your errors don't have to go up too much so there's no substantial quality loss and if you look at salaries well in this case you can compare how much you can save on salaries so there's quite a bit of an impact okay I want to conclude with this. I had the last paper, but I think I should not do that, right? Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to address questions. If you want to extend your study to another industry, just by starting from the beginning, you cannot take your model and see that it is applicable. This is Rawat. Uh, I mean, I want to put it in the road, because India road accident is the most common. Huh? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think the general principles will still apply. But, um, but basically, we are also doing now a study. <laughs> but but it, it, it's a good question because in India it would be very, very needed. So currently, we are doing research, uh, Debjit and I, we are doing research. We have one paper published already on safety on the road in India. So, does the personality of a driver impact the behavior on the road so that accidents could be reduced? That's the study we are currently doing. And we do that together with a couple of Indian uh, transport companies. So we have uh, currently data of three companies, and we hope to extend it even to more companies. But one paper has already been published this <coughs> year. So it appears that uh, people who are more safety conscious don't have more, um, fewer accidents or something, but it appears that they are more productive in driving. That's one of the first results we found, based on a, a study of uh, one of the transport companies, and many routes, many drivers. Um, so, yeah, the, the results surprised me a bit, to be honest. That was not something that I immediately expected. In hindsight, we can explain it, uh, but we have to do more studies here, that's for sure. And our objective is also to help reduce accidents on the road in India. Sorry, how do you match match? Match? Match theory. Like this. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know that theory. I'm sorry. Uh, sunstain and uh, dandelion. Uh, so it's uh, means what they do is like instead of uh, so they give a sort of push, like some display something. Yeah. Like uh, you have something on cigarette packs. Yeah. That's a kind of match. 
Okay. And without the constant, without the like, uh, intervention, but intervention very simple. Yes. In fact, I did an experiment like that as well. So it was uh, it was a. Uh, an experiment, no, I didn't do it myself. One of my master students did it in, a, in his thesis project. So he looked at one of the companies called DHL Express. So they deliver uh, parcels for a business to business environment. And they have this, uh, this tool that tells you uh, immediately when you, well, it's basically a sort of game. They have made a game out of it. So it tells you whether you're a top performer and whether you exceed the limit or so. And everyone wants to be, wants to be the top performer because there's a small award involved. But it's not so much focused towards safety, in this case, it's focused towards fuel consumption. So they want to consume less fuel. So drive more careful that you use less fuel. Don't step on the gas. Anticipate better. And the best driver who has consumed the least fuel for his trips wins. And you get a and the old game. They see the scores of the others, you know, and they can compare themselves constantly. And that works very well. It's a great performer. Yeah, that, that is one area that you can extend to. Yes, yes, I think so. I think so. In fact, I tried another study that was a study in the warehouses where the trucks also have something. It's called a bump device. There is a measure. There's a special measurement device that measures all the bumps. So whether you uh, accelerate or decelerate or bump into something, and that registers it, and you can make it public. And making things public also helps. There was a third study, and that's a study we're currently doing, so no result yet. And that's also a company where they indeed, so it's a company in India where they have in the trucks, they have a device that measures hard braking. So the number of hard brakes and hard accelerates are measured, and you can make it public. The company doesn't do that yet, but it's all registered, so they could do it. And in general, these types of things help. And this comes with the domain of internet of things also. Yes, because it's also a lot of big data, so yeah. But that was my next talk, I think, so. <laughs> so how can you use all this data? Yeah, and make a nice model out of that. Thank you very much for your attention.